Welcome to Gas, Poetry, Art, and Music. I'm your host, Belinda Subramon. Well, it's really nice to meet you, Debbie. Um, you seem to be quite a powerhouse of talent with a, a wider range of, uh, of interest. Uh oh, <laughs> that sounds like a lot to live up to. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first, I want to talk about the um, the National Beat Poetry Foundation that you started. Yes. Um, uh, now, when did you become interested in in the beats? I've always been interested. Uh, not necessarily the beats, but Jack Kerouac. Uh, and when I was uh, in my early 20s, I lived for a while um, in a big uh, kind of warehouse that one of the artists um, that I shared the space with, they made into this one big apartment and um, while I was living there I taught Tai Chi Chuan um, at a martial arts studio on the west side of New York and uh, Allen Ginsberg would walk in there <laughs> and practice sometimes so I never really got to know him he kind of kept to himself he would just come in and practice, and that was about it. But I knew who he was. Um, but I always had a love of Jack Kerouac. I felt a connection to him. I don't know if it was because um, as a kid, I would watch the Steve Allen show. <laughs> And I saw him on there and I thought he was so handsome. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to read some of his writing and, and I did, you know, as I got older. But um, he was, his birthday was um, March 12th and I'm March 15th and my mother was March 17th. So we were all Pisces. I don't know if that, had anything to do with it but I I just felt some kind of connection there well uh what prompted you to it had to take a lot of passion to want to start the National Beat Poetry Foundation what really got you to do that I I belong to a lot of poetry groups through the years and um some of them would have all these rules, like you couldn't read uh, your poetry unless you followed this certain form. And I always, I, I didn't like that. As an artist, uh, drawing and painting, you know, I never wanted to go by any rules set by anybody. So this is what happened. Um, I had a few friends that were interested in, in um, starting an organization like this. And um, they helped me, you know, have some events. But I actually started the foundation because I felt someone has to do this uh, to give everyone a voice. Because I, I saw there were people in the community, they would say, I'm not allowed to read at any of the poetry events. They don't like my poetry because um, I might have swear words in there or I might talk about subjects that are, you know, not accepted by everyone. Um, people are afraid, you know, something's gonna happen. If I talk about certain subjects like, uh, killing, you know, killing and um, hangings and you know, all this stuff that happens to a lot of uh, native peoples. 
And um, so anyway, I started the organization in 2016. Um, although I had been having events, like serious events, like beat poetry events since 2014 with some friends of mine. But I actually started the organization in 2016. I registered it. I know you get this a lot, uh, people asking you, well, how do you define beat poetry? So I guess I'm going to ask you that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, to me anyway, it's, um, it's a very free form uh, type of poetry. There are no rules. So when people say to me, I'm not a beat poet, I'll ask them, you know, do you have something important to say that means something to you? And they'll say yes. And I said, well, then you're a beat poet. You um, just don't know it yet. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, like I said, I'm unencumbered by all those rules that people put out there. Um, yeah, I read somewhere where you had said it meant like to keep evolving and also an awareness of uh, the events happening and speaking, speaking out about them. Does that ring true? You know, to, uh, to be ecologically and socially conscious about what's going on and to feel free to talk about it, to write about it. Oh, uh, yes. You know, if you, if you go out and just talk about certain subjects, you might get uh, hurt or killed, you know, and you still might, even with poetry. But when you are reciting poetry, it's your own feelings and people are more accepting of it being presented that way. Well, also, I've noticed that you're an avid nature photographer. Uh, when did that passion begin for you? As a young child, um, my parents got me my first brownie camera. <laughs> I don't even know what age I was, uh, maybe 10 or 12. <laughs> and um, I just started taking pictures. I grew up on um, a dairy farm, and actually I live in the, the house that my grandfather built uh, with his friend, an old farmhouse here. It's falling apart practically, but <laughs> it still exists. Uh, and it's the only thing that exists of this area of the dairy farm. Everything else has been the, the forest, uh, the has been cut down uh, and built. I'm surrounded by buildings, factories. Um, yeah, there is no more uh, space, you know, free space here, except for this house um, and the land that's on it. Our little nature, I mean, all the animals that live around here basically live in our we we have like uh, we don't cut down the the trees surrounding you know the, our yard um so we have a lot of animals that live here so you don't always see them but they're here so you kind of live on a nature preserve then no no <laughs> i mean it's my own little nature preserve in yeah. my mind i guess yeah so you feel a deep connection to to nature and you always have is that right? I have. Uh, growing up, you know, this was a 66 acre farm and it was all woods. Uh, there were no people, no houses, uh, you know, just our house. And um, so, you know, my friends basically were the animals, you know, that we had. Uh, we had a dog and cat and um chickens we had uh, a, a one goose and a um, hundred cows I totally here okay. identify I was raised next to a forest and I played alone in it for years <laughs> well I see that you have several books of photography uh out and some with poetry 
Uh, are they all available still? They are, but I'm, I'm coming out with a new collection of a lot of my past poetry and some new poetry. Um, it's going to be published by uh, Human Era Publishing, Paul Richmond's uh, brand. And um, it's going to have some black and white photographs in there. But yes, the other ones, um, uh, some of them are so expensive because they were they were done in all color. Yeah, uh, I can't even afford to buy. Them. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's, the, that's, one. that's the thing about sharing our our photography and our art. It's so expensive to reproduce. I see that you have a collection, Tantric Love Suicide. Yeah, uh, and uh, well, do you have some poems? A couple of poems you'd like to read for us? Um. Well, this is a, a poem that I wrote a while back. It's in some of those books. It'll be in my new book, too. And it, it describes what a lot of our, uh, a lot of all artists feel when they're working and no one's noticing, you know, that uh, they're working hard and no one even looks their way or at their work. And I call this tragic artist. Yes, a tragic artist, that's me. Molding the clay, tearing pieces away, painting on canvas, messing with brushes, ruining creations on a daily basis. Drinking to excess, of course, showing distress. Yes, a tragic artist, that's me. Taking breathtaking photos of everything lively, while deep inside contemplating suicide. Ready to jump, what's the use trying? Down in a slump. Yes, a tragic artist, that's me. Creating beauty for everyone's eyes, but no one else sees the tragic artist that is me. And I think that that kind of explains how most artists feel, whether they are living that way or not, they just feel that way inside that no one's ever going to see their work or appreciate it. And they put years of, you know, their soul into creating something. Yes. Yeah. This is about uh, verbal abuse that mostly women uh, experience in their relationships, not only with, you know, their significant others, but even with their families. But it is, it seems to be like something that women uh, seem to experience more. Outwardly, she looked fine. No bruises could you find. But beyond her sad eyes, well-defined and outlined, Emotional and verbal abuse. It leaves scars. Yes, it does. Creates a life full of stress, crippled by years full of tears, of cruel, demeaning words, feeling no one cares. Robbed of self-worth, she wept silently, alone. Said she wasn't smart enough, a moron, an idiot, stupid. Nothing could be done to his satisfaction. Her feelings and desires just didn't matter. Afraid of his displeasure, she felt less than lesser. Her self-esteem gone, under extreme pressure, now withdrawn, she lived in isolation. Demeaning her every word, his pleasure was to create terror, find her every error, live in years of living cut off from family, friends, her misery and despair took her mind elsewhere. Wanting to escape, but left alone to stare at the walls, she dreamt of somewhere, a life free of strife. She longed to be free and whole again. It took all she had to break loose of the invisible chains 
created by her suppressor. And to finally leave those scars unseen, looking in a mirror, she saw a reflection of whom she wasn't, uh, but had become. It made her see the light. She could have a life, claim her own ideas, at peace to finally be herself, standing strong. She was worthy as we all are. Emotional and verbal abuse, it leaves scars. Yes, it does. It takes love, love of self, to be proud of, to live a life of just being yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me today. And it's so, I'm so excited to meet you as I've been <laughs> reading about you and all that you do and all the festivals that you produce and all that you do for poets. Thank you very much for that. Well, I, I hope that, um, you know, we do, we have a lot of collaborations together in the future. Well, I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Pinata. Seatbelts aren't the law yet. Break for the red light, the sudden stop sign, the last sunray hitting the lone palm tree, the cross where Jesus died on the distant mountaintop, the exodus, the parking space across the street from the open marketplaces, she says remind her of when we lived in Madrid. I don't remember cobblestone or slabs of meat hanging from racks or baskets and flowers or terra vera pottery, but I remember the piñata she hung from the shady tree in our backyard just east of Hollywood and on my birthday hitting the blue, purple, yellow, and orange paper mache horse with a baseball bat and opening my eyes just a slight crack so I could see where all the candy fell. Day do dream of a girl in her snow globe world. I thought, I thought, I thought I could dream my way out from behind the glass into, into, into the boulevards where glitter falls from the sky where pockmarked roads masquerade as crystal balls and the future holds you out for me to run into your arms, to feel your breath on my neck, to realize I've been saved. Falling, 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 falling from the sky. I press my lips on the glass, a window to tumble through, my breath rap, rap, rapping. Come to me, come to me, come to me. I'm dying. The dome was so small, a miniature world I could easily inhabit, I thought, 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 until the moisture was sucked out. The be heat began to rise, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't breathe. Gasping, grasping, I mean, I'm gasping, I'm aghast, I mean, I'm grasping, I mean, I'm reaching. You are falling from the sky, a million tiny stars. You are the somersault, internal, eternal, eternally disrupting calm. I crawl to you, to the border, to the edge, to the periphery, to the sea, to the globe, to the moon. My knees are scraped, my hands are blistered, my feet swollen, my tongue bleeding. I am spilling out into the streets, a running disaster, not fit for life or love, a gurgling newborn awaiting transformation when I see a shape in the distance and a cool breeze breathes down on this fever and the snow begins to fall. Falling, falling, falling. You are the fallen snow, the self, the sprinkle of heaven, the one who lets the moisture in, the key, the key, the key, the key, the key to the boulevards. Spirit tells the body to chant. You tell me to be devastated and I will be devastated in the light and dark. I will devastate. You ask me to moan, and I will moan for everyone. You send me sorrow and bonds, and I will construct a box. You tell me to get in the box, and I will slide in. 
You tell me to use nails, you bought me, and I will tap them ever so slightly into my bones. You get me to shatter the silence with a scream, and I will scream and sob, and in the box you speak to me like stones and water. I will never heal. You remind me of my body, and I am reminded of my body. If you draw on my body, if you tell me to pray, you say to me that future and nature are the same thing, and I pick up the branches from the hollow. You file your complaints in a sea of rust, and I catch them. I covet them. You tell me to covet, working for nothing and selling everything, so I sell my body. You ask to look at my body, so I take off my clothes and stand up straight. You demand my face, I demand it back with flowers. You die, and my flowers die. You, spirit, reclaim the dead flowers, and like a paintbrush on my body, fill them with color again. You sit and watch the children, you wash your mouth, you ask to see the girls, you see the girls, you ask me to kill. Tell me to kill. But nature is the future. You let the gaze of the clouds and moon stick to my skin. My skin was clean. I clean my skin again. I take off my clothes and look at my body. Here it is. I am just giving it to you. King. When fish were king, the streets was paved in dreams. Three-day millionaires filled the pubs to bursting. Three-piece suit and muffler were royal robes. Did three lives lived in one, two, three perfect days. Us kids knew no different in our short journey. Knew nothing of reality and sixties bulldozers. For our validity laid in Fremo's unexplained existence. Thruppence for a bag of chips wrapped in newspaper, a tanner for a bar of chocolate from Fogarty's, a bob for the gas meter to cook us tea. This was our sort of real world reality. Peppered, grey haired, in grey suits, grey men, with plans and clipboards and clipped ideas for a better life with concrete and high-rise mud cons, swept away drab homes both sides of street, and those buildings there don't meet the new ideal. As for the inhabitants who infest these Victorian slums, forgotten people, abandoned, deserted, cast aside, bygone, lost, fell through the cracks, lapsed, just slipped one's mind, the kind of people who knew what salt of the earth meant, men of iron and women genuine and warm. Well, for the most part, as happens, the men in grey suits didn't see what we saw, a snuggle and huddle, back-to-back world, an ask and see, drunken Whoopee! Not heading for the highs in Babel world, but a steam pudding and custard, Cox's fish cake, scraps and mushy peas, drying clothes on clothes horse by fire, damp dogs cooking with the cat, magic in the lingo sort of uh, sort of world, long gone people erased, buried, clean forgot. Blotted out, cast away, God forsaken people who lived and loved here when fish were king.
is Donny Winter, and this is a poem from my recent collection, Feats of Alchemy. The poem is titled, When I Come Home. When I come home, I travel between the bends in pavement rivers and follow the sunset as it dips toward white pine tree lines whose titan arms threaten to swallow the day. When I come home, a sullen beast crawls into my sternum and steers my eyes toward all things derelict. The rusted tractor overgrown in the field, unsure of its color, the fresh tree stumps left from a summer storm, the twisted deer carcass tossed along the roadside, and the decaying houses left by families who haven't seen each other since the deaths of grandparents. When I come home, tattered Confederate flags hang on naked limbs just outside this somnolent town, framed by the sloped silhouettes of weathered hills, the same old mountains who've known history long before us. When I come home, the cats slink to their food bowls, no longer thrilled by the hunt, and my tired parents retire to their ends of the house, while I, seeing these places through teenage eyes, walk these trails with hope that memories never die. The right side of my bed is a foreign country. Exotic stained glass and bronze sculpture side. A place to sink and float. A land of dreams and eventual sleep. The left side is the work side the reading a book side, the closer to the bathroom side, the I'm getting ready to feed the cats side, the I'm really up but I'm down side, the I'm just odd enough to write this down side. called Universal We. Hopes dashed on the rocks, it all falls down, and I'm alone, but am I alone or am I expecting loneliness? The wheel turns and I turn with it, I dance to music only I can hear. The world crushes, but sometimes gently. There's a spark between us, a soul cry, and I sighed away, my breath matching the clouds. My friends and I, we are living on our own native life in the wilds. We dance free and then live among the stars. Hi, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello, Belinda. Lovely to see you. I know we've been in we've been in contact vaguely for for decades. It's so nice to finally see you. We and have indeed, yes. Uh, we've seen each other in our in different magazines, different things. You write poetry, sci-fi. Tell me what all you do. Yeah, poetry, sci-fi, music. You, you, you name it. That's it. Okay, but we're here mainly today to talk about your new music book about the Hollies coming out very mm. soon in the States, already out in England. Yeah, there we are. Right. So what prompted you to write this book about the Hollies? Um, it, it's called On Track, The Hollies, every album, every song, and it's from Sonic... Sonic Bond publishes, and it's available from Amazon and your usual kind of online retailers. Um, well, uh, the, the 60s as an um, as a era of music has been ruthlessly uh, uh, academically written about and uh, chronicled and archived. Everybody's written about uh, 
the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and the Who. But I mean, the Who, the uh, the, the the Hollies were very much part of that uh, of that scene, although perhaps they've been a little neglected. So I thought uh, it's a good opportunity to record their history as well. I, I, I've since discovered there are a couple of other books about the Hollies, but uh, they don't uh, uh, follow the same same kind of pattern that I have in this book, which is to uh, cover every album and every track, every song in in detail from the very first album right through until uh, virtually today. Because there has been a form of the Hollies in existence since since the 60s, right through the 70s and the 80s, and in, right up to the present day. In fact, they were still touring until uh, the COVID lockdown. That's interesting and good for them. Well, yeah. for youngsters... Yeah, you know, I mean, um, if you're a, a poet, you write poems. If you're an artist, you paint pictures. If you're a musician... You, you you know you play music that's what you do so uh, I don't really see why when you get to a particular age you should give it up you just continue doing what you've always done it gets harder sometimes when you get older well, perhaps perhaps I, yeah yeah uh, so uh, for those who may not know uh, Graham Nash is probably the most famous and of course he went on to be uh, with the Crosby Stills Nash and Young. Uh, he was also one of the main singers of the Hollies. Yes, he was. Yeah. And, in uh, fact, it was there. In fact, it was the uh, the harmonies of uh, Graham Nash and Alan Clark that sort of defined the Hollies sound. It was obviously based on the Everly Brothers. They were, they were big fans of the Everly Brothers. In fact, they they they, they had met the Everly Brothers in Manchester when they were still uh, teenagers, and they were very inspired by the Everly Brothers. And, uh, also, the they got their name Hollies after Buddy Holly. After Buddy Holly, that's the, yeah, that, that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll look for that book, um, the Hollies. Every yeah, like, like I said, they, they they started off in uh, they, they they first came to uh, notice in 1963, which was a very strange and a unique year. In, in, in British pop, because the Beatles had happened in, in, in January with Please Please Me, which was the first uh, hit in the UK. And for, for 1963, they were massive in the UK, but they were totally unknown outside the UK. I mean, obviously, they, they didn't break through in America until 1964 when they did I Want to Hold Your Hand on uh, the Ed Sullivan Show. So for a year, we had the Beatles as a, as a kind of a local phenomenon. That's when I actually saw them on stage in, in Hull, at the ABC Theatre in Hull. I saw the Beatles there. And of course, as soon as the Beatles happened, there was a sudden upsurge of other uh, uh, groups, northern groups, who, 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 who came in their wake, including Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, uh, Freddie and the Dreamers, the Searchers, uh, the Swinging Blue Jeans, the Foremost, all that lot. And... Uh, just, just creeping in the bottom of that scene, there was the, the Hollies and the, 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 the uh, new kids on the block who were the Rolling Stones. They were just kind of starting to make waves. So 1963 was an interesting year. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book, uh, Was Elvis's Bastard Love Child? And... Yeah, that's, yeah, that was my sort of first book, I Was Elvis Presley's Bastard Love Child, which came from Head Press. And uh, that was essentially a, a collection of interviews that I'd done over the previous years. Uh, the publisher invited me to, to participate on this project. And uh, we, 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 we got together and we horse traded. I wanted this interview to go in. He wanted that interview to go in. We kind of traded back, backwards and forwards. And eventually it came up with a format in which there was uh, interviews which I'd done with the... Uh, uh, the, the Kinks, The Birds, uh, Grace Slick of Jefferson Airplane, uh, Country Joe and the Fish, uh, Robert Plant of uh, Led Zeppelin, of course, Susie of the Banshees, uh, all, all, all those people. And that, that book came out, and I, and I think they did a, a pretty good job uh, laying it out with the artwork and all this kind of thing. It's beautiful, a beautiful uh, book that they, they, they produced. 
in the cost of, back then, I mean, uh, music came in the form of 45 RPM singles, vinyl singles. And I remember the, uh, when uh, The Birds, Mr. Tambourine Man was issued and I was in, in Hull, City Centre, and I had just enough money to either buy the single or uh, catch the bus home. So I bought the single. I walked the five miles home carrying that single in my sweaty hand. Oh, yes, that, I, that's definitely a true music. And when I, when I met Gene Clark of The Birds, I actually told him that story and he was quite amused by it. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, obviously I was always, always into music and um, particularly during the, uh, the late 60s, I was sort of, I met Genesis P. Orridge of, you know, I don't really know him, Th Throbbing Gristle. He was kind of a, an eccentric character in, in Hull. I kind of uh, interviewed him. He was like one of the first people I interviewed. Later on, I, I, was, I was producing uh, my arts magazine, Lud's Mill. And one of the things that was happening around then was that uh, rather than uh, getting signed to major record labels, left, right and centre, bands were actually producing their own music on, uh, you know, and issuing it on cassette editions or sometimes even, you know, the, founding their own labels, indie, indie records, which was like a new phenomenon. So I started covering that. And there was a band in Sheffield who uh, took out a full page advertisement in Lud's Mill and also sent me their, their own uh, home produced record. And th this was a group called Vice Versa, who subsequently became ABC, who had a massive hit with uh, Black Skin of Love. They, they were, you know, they had hits in the States as well with uh, When Smokey Sings. You know that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you mentioned your magazine, Lud's Mail, and we have a feature on you. Um, That's right, yeah. Yes, there is, yeah. On uh, gas, poetry, mm -hmm. art, and music yeah. at dot blogspot.com. And yeah. uh, in your blog is eight miles higher, right? Yeah. Dot yeah. blogspot.com, just because it's easier that way. Yeah. And uh, I, I've gone through the thing about buying domain names and I've been ripped off and I've been abused and I've had my domain stolen and that's why I don't bother anymore. <laughs> mm. Anyway, so... Oh dear. That sounded like a blues song in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you interviewed uh, Grace Slick. What was she? Grace, Grace Slick, yeah. I mean, she, she was a goddess. I'd always simply adored Grace Slick. And in fact, uh, during the course of the interview, she said that uh, she was living by herself. So I actually uh, asked if she'd marry me, but she turned me down, unfortunately. Yeah, she, she, yeah, yeah, she was, she, she was totally amazing. She's a force of nature, is, uh, is Grace Slick. So, uh, well, uh, it all sounds very exciting. Well, I say um, I, um, I enjoy what I do. Yeah. I get an immense kick from doing it, and that's what that's you know that's what it's all about. Yes. You keep on keeping on. Right. There's yeah. always a new project, you know, there's always a new project coming. We'll keep doing it until we can't. And that's, <laughs> then we're gone. <laughs> okay. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Right. Very, very nice talking with you. E excellent. Yeah, we'll do it again. We'll do right. it again. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Belinda. People get shoved this way and that every day of their lives. They don't know where to go, they don't know what to say That's the way their lives get pushed What do you do when your life gets pushed in a way you don't want to go? What do you do when people push you in a way you don't want to show Like your feelings? Feelings get trapped in someone else's dream Your life gets trapped in someone else's scream It becomes yours eventually Working all day in some kind of job Feeling all day in some kind of way You don't know yourself anymore And the people around you Everything becomes crazy and confused It's not your life anymore If I seared a snowflake with a needle, would it fall apart? And would I watch it dismembered, scattered in a million drops? 
Could I feel pain at causing the death of water molecules? What if all of them fell to earth and hardened? What if I could take a chainsaw to them and split them into a snowman? Wouldn't that be a way to build a salute to a winter's frost? The point being that from needles and knives and sharp pointy objects come creations that beg for a different eye to mold them, a different hand to make them, a different way to blend them, spilling into a roadway that can't figure out which direction it's going. The road is fear, the saw is love. The flake is the sum of what is left after you realize that what you needed all along had not evaporated, but was in fact always there. The wind is choreographer, is not a wrecking ball, sometimes more like a whipped lashing, an uncontrolled blow of a silent hand that stirs up leaves and dust coming from a mouth that curves up not from a smile, but from the force of what it exhales. You see, the wind can offer a friendly dose of advice, it can carry on a lazy conversation, or it can howl like it's been chopped in two. But the curve of the lips demanding deliverance of rain or twilight blinking or sun entranced in a daze of diamonds will never cease to speak their mind. It's what the wind dares create, all that choreography calming my wretched soul on a day of dancing limbs. Entryway. A home I'll never return to is blanched from the blazing sun of my mind's eye, electric and alive. As if I had just reached that churning field across the street and witnessed a glorious rising. A home I'll never see again has twisting halls and a fireplace and a backyard that possesses the ghosts of all the games played there, of all the family feasts, of gardens and pretend gardens, of dreams of gardens. It carries a memory of soreness and tears of exponential hurt that does not disintegrate with the concrete at its base. It is not changing with time, but bearing witness to it and standing against it. It is solid brick and two entry doors. It is a bedroom's crease of used blankets. It is the folds of comfort, a home I'll never walk through again, stamped and branded within my skin. It would remember me and I it if ever we were to meet within its golden portal. I favor democracy to racist windbag edicts, truth to lies, love to cruel suppression. He favors strong man dictators on his side, blood and soil, guns to enforce his succession. The rules are those with the most money have the loudest voices and are allowed to say anything, including lies. Obfuscation, misdirection, yellow media hysteria are the staples of info for the enslaved. Calling it free speech, tell a lie so often 70 million people come blindly to believe it point their guns at a 250-year-old democratic republic while tripping over oligarchs of every stripe and nationality, out looking for legislators with hands out, mouths that'll spew whatever bullshit they're paid to spew. Kleptocrats and fascists want control, they use cruelty and fear and gerrymandered lines to achieve single-party power aimed at keeping money flowing up the chains. That's right, your chains, forged by corruption, cruelty, and avarice, allowed to flourish because too many Americans are indifferent to what's going on. The end of the world has come and gone. In retrospect, I should have seen it coming. It was going to happen eventually, but the final moment was not as obvious 
as a posted notice. The subtle signs were there, the look in your eyes, the words on your lips, in the likeness of the Virgin Mary that appeared in the oak tree, in sermons from pastors, in natural disasters, fire, flood, and blood, signs of the apocalypse, the arrival of the four horsemen, condominium foreclosures, department store doors closing, uneaten restaurant meals decomposing, jobs disappearing, the end of the world was nearing. Now that the end has happened, flesh cut to the bone, a caretaker with nothing but himself to take care of, I stand alone with pen in hand, with one question remaining. Who am I writing for? Alone in the dead zone, the last man on earth. Thank you for listening and watching Gas, Poetry, Art, and Music. If you'd like to encourage us, please subscribe to our channel, like, comment if you will, share, and tell your friends about our project. And we hope to see you next time.